Hello and welcome to These Are the Days of Our Podcast. I'm Lisa. And I'm Jen. And today we're talking about International Makeup Day, which is celebrated on August the 4th. Yay! I guess we should clarify it's makeup on your face. Yeah, it's not making up with someone or making up a story. Yeah. It's cosmetics. Cos- Booty. Cosmetics. Yeah, we wouldn't mm-hmm. make up with anyone. We'll stand our ground until we die. <laughs> this kidding. is the hill I die on. Yeah. 100%. I had a dream that I had to tell someone that I'm really bad at apologizing, which is not <laughs> inaccurate. <laughs> But in my dream last night, I was like, I'm really bad at apologizing, but I need to tell you that I'm sorry. (laughs) Tell me about what you think of makeup. I mean, I really like makeup. I'm a fan. I think it's fun. It's fun getting it done. It's fun doing it yourself. Sometimes you're like in a panic when you're leaving and you don't want to do your face, but I always feel good after. Love a good lip. Oh, me too. Love some big eyelashes. That is the thing that I dream of is getting eyelash extensions again. Oh, I mean, I think we should just do it. I agree. My very favorite is a bold lip and I am obsessed with YSL number 19, which is kind of like this like magenta-y, fuchsia-y lip. So I would say that's my signature color, which makes me feel so much like a lady to have a signature lip color. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, mine's Cinderella. From the Disney collection. (laughs) Yeah, from the Disney collection of ColourPop, donated by Emily, obviously. Like a lady. Like Like a a true lady. lady. I also really like Ariel, obviously. I like all the Disney princesses. I mean, it's funny, as you'll hear in the conversation with Emily, my mom doesn't wear makeup, and her mom never really wore makeup. And so it's not really like in my family, but yeah, mine too. My mom never wears makeup. I think the closest thing she gets is like face cream and lip chap. (laughs) That's basically it. Yeah. And I think the only time I've seen my mom with makeup was when I did her makeup for my brother's wedding. But other than that, it's definitely not something that was really promoted or really encouraged in my family. My sisters aren't really into makeup either. And I used to get in a lot of trouble as a child uh, once coming home with nail polish and being forced to go to like my dad's workshop. And I had to get like turpentine to take it off because I wasn't allowed to have nail polish polish so our mothers might be exceptions because makeup has existed forever ancient cultures including our favorite ancient egypt used tons of makeup were really preoccupied with aesthetics and so things like coal which is basically like that black eyeshadowy Mm. thing which was made out of very healthy products like lead copper ash and burnt almonds amazing were were used um, to exaggerate the eyes. And then apparently the Sumerians were actually pre-ancient Egypt and they used some sort of lipsticks. But also the things like skin resurfacing using pumice and chemical peels and then all sorts of like skin treatments. They've been used for like 5,000 years. So according to history aka the one article i read about the history of makeup the rise of complex societies really has led to an ever-increasing demand for cosmetic and just being able to change your appearance according to the like evolution of the ages and what's considered beautiful yeah and i think but i think where that um because we both grew up in religious families that I think that uh, lack of makeup does come because it, it is mentioned in the Bible a couple of times mm-hmm. and it's never in a good way. So they argue against cosmetic use because it encouraged vanity. And I read this article about how Stoicism, which was a popular philosophy in ancient Rome, founded on moral goodness and basically moral deeds 
are related to goodness. And so your beauty, true beauty comes from moral acts, not from your physical form. And in ancient Rome, only the ladies of the night mm-hmm. wore rouge. Mm-hmm. So not that popular. But then it like came in and out of popularity. So if you know, I feel like a little bit about history, I think you can guess when cosmetics were popular and when when they were not. What, when do you think they weren't popular? Like in the medieval ages? No, but apparently they were popular then because there were so many like plagues and illnesses. They used it to like cover up their leprosy. Their disgusting boils. <laughs> Basically. Obviously in the Victorian era, no makeup. Just have to be pure. No makeup whatsoever. Except for if you were a lady of the night or an actress, which was almost one and the same, which yeah. we know from Bridgerton. The cultured ladies in the Victorian era would still use kind of lightening powders, which yeah. were mostly just lead, because um, having darkened skin from the sun signified, you know, being poor and having to work yeah. in the fields. So they which would is like use still like- the case in a lot of Asian countries. They're mm-hmm. like, you don't want to have dark skin. That's why, like, every Korean product has whitening solution in it. Which I, when I was in Japan, nearly bought some because they don't have English labels. So I was like, oh, these look beautiful and lovely. And then I realized I probably don't need whitening solution or I would turn transparent. Yeah. <laughs> They definitely had that whitening powder, but they just didn't do anything, which is just so boring. God, the Victorians were so boring. (laughs) No wonder all the weird stuff came out from there. Definitely. Yeah. So repressed. Interestingly, the patterns of feminism also, like these waves correspond to this as well. So natural faces in the 70s were viewed as quite a radical act because they was kind of pushing against the patriarchal expectations versus lipstick feminism, which is more third wave feminism. And it has the idea of embracing quote unquote traditional concepts of femininity. So the philosophical background to lipstick feminism is that a person could be empowered through embracing that side. The difference between feminists in the 70s versus 90s is like this philosophical divide. Yeah, so, yeah, lots of makeup, makeup things. Makeup things, makeup things, makeup things. I thought it was really interesting to think about how perceptions and also cost of makeup. People who wear makeup end up spending nine days a year applying makeup, which does have a significant cost. When we think about the gendered wage gaps and all of these power differentials, the expectation that women to be professional must have a face of makeup means that we expect some people to spend that time to do this. And then also the idea that anyone that's interested in makeup, it's viewed as something very frivolous versus some male interest or traditionally male interest seems much more serious. So I think that it would be more socially acceptable to start a conversation at the beginning of a meeting about football. But if I started a conversation about skincare or nail polish, it just doesn't seem as professional. And that like reflects so many of the gendered biases that exist. I looked up a couple of studies because I thought this was quite interesting. One of them is maybe she's born with it. Maybe it's the patriarchy. (laughs) (laughs) This study, which was published in the Journal of Sex Roles, they had people evaluating women wearing heavy makeup versus not wearing makeup. They viewed people who were wearing a lot of makeup as less human less warm and less moral this was men and women so there's definitely some internalized misogyny there the study found that this was even worse if it was a dramatic eye or a loud lipstick so basically you were viewed as less warm and less competent if you had a smoky eye or a bold lip i feel like that is like so true there's that inherent like if you wear makeup in a professional setting enhance whatever features but if someone came into work and they had like a smoky eye and like caked on orange makeup i'd be like maybe we should 
have an HR meeting about this. Yeah, but at the same time, then there's this, it's a catch-22 because there's other, there's a lot of other studies that show that women who don't wear makeup are viewed as less competent, less capable, reliable, and amicable in the workplace compared to women that have a quote unquote professional level of well, makeup. and so <laughs> it's like there's some really funny TikToks where it's like what men think na- a natural face is, and it's like you still put on all the same products. So you're wearing primer, foundation, concealer, eyebrow pencil, eyeshadow, mascara, lipstick bronzer highlighter but you're just doing it in a different way so it looks quote-unquote natural Mm -hmm. even some lip gloss some lipstick and that's acceptable to have a quote-unquote natural look or professional look but anything in either direction no makeup or too much makeup not okay it seems so impossible there's just such subtle expectations where you know if you leave the house completely barefaced you might be perceived in so many different ways but then there's also like the internal side of it because I think that a lot of people have discussed how wearing makeup makes them feel they feel like they are getting to choose what they're putting out into the world and if we think about gender roles and things like drag and thinking about the power of makeup and the power of deciding how you present yourself in the world it's It can be really powerful, but I feel like it's such a quagmire. Yeah. Sometimes you just gotta not give an F. (laughs) That's true. Just gotta do what you want Mm -hmm. and not give an F. I think in general, the, the feeling is that most people seem to be viewing makeup as something that you're able to choose. You might choose to use as a tool to present yourself in the world the way that you want to be presented. It's not necessarily always about conforming to the beauty standard, but it might be a way of just being able to define yourself in the way that you want to be defined. So let's just view it that way. It's just do what you want. Yeah, just do what you want. And don't give an F. And don't give an F. Today on the podcast, we have a very exciting guest. Emily! My, probably my favorite cousin. Sorry to the other ones. I don't have very many, so it's, I guess, it's still a, a little bit rude. I mean, but I they like. probably don't listen to the podcast. So also, she's the only girl. Like, the other ones are just dumb boys. I don't know what else to say except for they're just dumb boys. So, they have cooties. Emily's my favorite. Anyways, Emily's here to talk about makeup since she is an actual expert. She knows all. I'd say almost all of my makeup is just donated from her. I have a whole thing of lipsticks, all from Emily. And by proxy, half of my makeup is second wave hand-me-downs. From Emily! Yeah, oh Emily, to Lisa, then to me. I guess we shouldn't talk about the health expiration dates because I've never followed those on makeup. Are they real? Like most people question- don't. Okay, question number one. Here's our first question. Are those real, those expiration things? Yes and no. More so it's so the company can't be sued if you're using a product after a certain amount of time because every product will have a symbol for how long it'll be good for after opening it. Right. But generally, one, powder products tend to last a lot longer than liquid products. And two, you should be able to tell if a product has gone bad. So like if a mascara is getting really clumpy or if things start smelling different oh, or that if would start be performing bad. differently. The things that you should probably pay the most attention to with expiration dates are things that go around your eyes. Oh. Because those are very sensitive. And like mascara wands, you're constantly putting air into them, taking the applicator in and out. So that could add some bacteria. In. And don't your eyelashes trap a lot of bacteria? Like that's kind of one of their purposes is to keep bacteria out of your eyes. So you're just like scraping it off of your lashes mm. and putting it into the tube? Basically too. Well, I feel like that's okay because mascara is something that I... A, purchase, I don't inherit from Emily, and B, that's like one thing you're like, if someone's going to put anything on, if I would put anything on my face, it would be like mascara and lipstick. And so my mascara, I'm actually going through at a quicker rate than my like million other products. And plus, it's like, 
you have you're not gonna have like um like the way lipstick i have like 30 lipsticks inherited from emily and i (laughs) those will last my entire life but mascara is like you have one you have one that works and looks good and then you you use up the whole product and then you're done maybe we should ask the makeup expert what is her necessary product if you could only put one thing on your face what would it be Usually if I'm going to put on one thing, because I have like different routines where it like has a different number of steps depending on what I want to do. If it's one oh, thing, it's probably going to be concealer. Oh. Mm. Just to make that flawless skin. Yeah, just to even out my skin tone, cover up blemishes and stuff like that. So if I'm going to go out and only put one product. You have actual perfect skin. So like I don't. I don't. I, it's because I always have makeup on that you can't tell that I don't have perfect skin. Okay, well, that, that was delusional. What is your, your routine with the most steps? How many steps are there? I'll just go through like product by product. Brow pencil, brow gel, eyeshadow primer, eyeshadow, mascara, primer, foundation, concealer. Blush, bronzer, highlight, lip product. So it's like 11 steps. 10, Whoa. 11. <laughs> and that's not including like your skincare routine. And it's not including the fact that you obviously wear more than one color eyeshadow. Yeah. So I would take like one palette and usually use three, four colors from that. What? Completely <laughs> awestruck. We have Whoa. saucer eyes. This is why you are being Whoa. interviewed for this. That's amazing. It's but I've also seen your handiwork and yeah, you she's good. Are very good. Oh, thank you. She's very good. She's a talented lady. So let's go back to little Emily. Just curious about what sparked your interest in makeup in the first place. Like, did your mom have a beauty routine? Did you like take her lipstick, <laughs> get in trouble? <laughs> no. no, I remember. <laughs> I- nope. No, my mom has a very basic routine. She was never super into it. She would use like the classic, the Maybelline. Even as like a business lady, she, Elaine mm-hmm. was peak business. She, she's very, like, business she's very woman. like classy. She is also pretty low maintenance, like with her beauty hair routine. So she would only wear like the very classic Maybelline Great Lash with the pink and green tube that everyone's mom uses mm-hmm. and still exists. Mm, classic. But other it's than that, one. she doesn't really use a lot of other stuff. And she has actually started using more because I will also give her some product. Oh, I feel cheated on. That's rude. Why do you give it to your mother? Give it to Well, because you two don't have the same skin tone. Oh, well, my Well, there my you mom. go. So the very first time I started wearing any makeup product regularly, by regularly, I mean basically on a daily basis, was when I was... 13, 14. I remember this for picture day. I know this picture. (laughs) Oh God. Yeah. I was very self-conscious about my skin because I did have acne problems a lot when I was younger and I was very, very self-conscious about it. So I convinced my mom to let me buy a foundation from the drugstore to wear for picture day to cover it up, even things out. I went to Shoppers Drug Mart. My mom came with me. They matched me to a powder foundation and I had no idea how to apply it. So I would just like put it on the sponge that came with it and put it all over my face. And when the pictures came out, I was straight up orange. It was, (laughs) it was awful. It was like, I, the match was off. It was everywhere. Like I was fluorescent Amazing. and it was horrifying <laughs> okay, it's not that bad it's not, it was i bad. know what picture it is it's not that it's not the it best is like peak picture mid 2000s i know bad makeup foundation matching okay i will say though maybe 1999 i without telling my mother put just glitter eyeshadow all over my lids no blending nothing and took a photo for picture day and i was like that is peak early 2000s just glitter pure glitter amazing regret nothing i think i inherited some glitter from you too because i remember wearing it to the spice girls concert that we wore that we went to yeah also didn't know how to apply that properly which is the moral of the story for the first many years of applying makeup So that was like the first key memory. And then I remember a year later getting into eyeshadow because, and this is another embarrassing story, I was going to my first high school dance and I was at an all-girls school. So I was very awkward and not socialized to boys. The day of the dance, 
I woke up and one of my eyes was super red, super swollen. And I was so embarrassed about it. I was like, why did this happen? have to happen today of all days? So I took a little tiny eyeshadow palette from my mom. It was like a goldish tone, put it all over both of my eyes, not knowing how to apply eyeshadow properly. I was using one of those little sponges that mm-hmm. came with palettes and then putting on a ton of CoverGirl Lash Blast Mascara, which was like the coolest mascara to wear in 2009. Very cool. And then I started doing that consistently and I got to the point where I was so used to seeing myself with eyeshadow on foundation every day that I continued with it for many, many years until about like five, six years ago when I finally started really caring to apply makeup properly and like getting into different types of products and techniques and stuff like that. So it's been a long time that I've been wearing a lot of makeup, but knowing how to do it properly is only very recent. It all came out of like being a very insecure teenager, though, mm-hmm. which I think is probably true for a lot of young women. I would say that that's a really true origin story for a lot of people. Uh, yeah, for that. But also, I think that one of the times that makeup in history became really popular was when people used to start sitting for portraits and it was the one time that they would have a picture taken and so I feel like your foundation experience for picture day was just really drawing on those original makeup users who were just like this is how I'm going to be remembered so I am gonna go orange and (laughs) nobody can tell me anything else you just said that one of the key things is learning how to do makeup properly so what is some advice that you might give to someone who would like to learn how to apply makeup properly the way that I did it is to follow YouTube videos because there's so many influencers and people in the beauty space now who some are just like makeup enthusiasts but a lot of them are also like trained makeup artists or people who like are are skilled with putting makeup on other people. So I found a lot of different channels that would explain techniques very well. So things like how to match foundation, like what part of your face are you supposed to put it on? Or some will say like, try and match your chest or your neck or your jaw, how to blend properly. So how to uh, use different types of makeup brushes to get the effect that you want. And then I always found it helpful to see people actually applying it. So you'll see, you can like copy the way that they do their blending. You can copy where they put their colors. Who are these YouTubers? Give some shout outs. I don't watch a lot of them anymore, but the ones that I watched a lot back in the day were Jaclyn Hill. She's very famous. Jaclyn Hill is is very famous. Yeah. She has like her own makeup line and a lot of other controversies, but what she was very good at (laughs) is explaining like makeup technique and how to apply it. One that I've been watching more recently is Robert Welsh because he's a trained uh, British makeup artist and he also explains like technique and theory very well. And he's also very funny. He's very entertaining. Who else? Kathleen Lights was one that I watched a lot because she does more simple looks, but she was also very good at explaining things and like making things approachable. Have you got onto TikTok makeup beauty space? Because I'm sure there's a lot of TikTok influencers now who are doing things. There are. I don't actually have TikTok though. My entire TikTok exposure is through other people reposting stories on Instagram. What? You don't have TikTok? And we thought you were the voice of the next generation. We thought you were the youth. The youth. No, that's Gen Z. I'm I'm in the middle where it's like can't be bothered with having yeah, too many she's, social media accounts. Mm, she's a younger millennial. We're elder millennials. Jen is the oldest millennial. Yeah. No, almost. No, it depends on where they draw Close. the line, but it usually yeah. is somewhere I think around. They do it in 1982 is like the oldest. I would have assumed that you were on the cusp of Gen Z. I think it's anyway. Yeah. Some people say from like 1995 onwards. Some people say 96. Some people say like 2000. Oh, so you are literally like a youngest. I think I'm like just towards the end of the millennial era. Mm. And I'm elder, mature, if you Mm, would. mm. Well, Mm -hmm. elder for sure, more mature, (laughs) I guess, is very mature. So here's a bit of a deeper question. Why do you like makeup so much? Give us the philosophy of your makeup routine. One, just the process of applying it. I always find it's very relaxing, just the sensation of like brushing things on your face blending applying colors Uh oh asmr yeah it's just a way to really focus on doing something only for yourself self-care 
Love it. Yeah. So doing something for yourself, like being able to choose, like, what do you want your eyeshadow to look like today? You can do literally anything you want. You can put red lipstick on if you're not feeling confident, you want to feel Mm -hmm. better about yourself, or if you want to wear glitter all over your face or have eyelashes that are an inch long then you can totally just do whatever you want I do want that I want all of that you can wash it off at the end of the day if you don't like it you can you know match things to your outfit it's really just a very I would say positive and often healthy way to for self-expression and it's fun like there's something fun about wearing like purple eyeshadow or like bright pink lipstick out one day that's true you've touched on so many things there there's the ritual of it and I think ritual is a term that is often used for things that seem a little bit higher brow but the ritual of putting something on and making space for yourself and it's almost in some ways it sounds almost like the way people describe a meditative practice where it's very mindful where you're just doing something But then also, I love what you were saying about you get to choose how you present yourself to the world and you can do things with your makeup that change the way that you present in the world and change potentially how other people respond to you because of the way that you do your makeup. Has there been any iconic moments in your makeup trials? Tell us the best and the worst. I really like the makeup that I did for Lisa's wedding. Oh, true. So true. Because I did my makeup myself that day and I was wearing like a light pinky purple dress. So I wanted to match the whole vibe that I was going for to the dress and to the hair and everything like that. So I really like the way that look turned out, especially because I think it like photographed really well, too. Yeah. We remember when we had the photograph of us, the three of us on route to the subway and Emily didn't want to stand with us. Yeah. You look very good at it, even if you didn't want to stand with us. I was preparing for COVID, mm-hmm. leaving like a couple feet of space between yeah. me and everyone else. It all, I think, like came together in a way that I was really happy with. Also, I think that my brows looked really good that day. Mm, true. Good brow. You naturally mm. have good eyebrows, though. You really lucked out. Yeah, I did. I did over wax them in high school, but thankfully they grew back thick enough. Oh, you <laughs> you missed the peak over waxing because I definitely I I admitted to Lisa earlier this week that I have had some sperm brows in the nineties and two thousand. Send us the, like pics. iconic. We over- want luck. receipts sperm brows and it was not a good look surprisingly that's shocking do you do you contour your face daily i don't actually use contour products or like follow contouring and highlighting principles i think the way that became very trendy 2014 onwards because of the kardashians yes around that time like there was that very famous photo of kim kardashian where her makeup artist had applied all the contours and the highlights before blending to see the placement of everything And that was really kind of, I think, what started mainstream contouring. But Mm -hmm. I never got super into that. One, because I did not trust myself to be able to know how to do it properly. Because bad contouring does not look amazing on your face. Plus, I think just the way that my face is shaped, like I have a very long face already. So if I contoured them, it would look too hollow. Like the scream. Yeah, I do use bronzer kind of in a place of contour which I think works to just add a little bit of color it's like the sun-kissed look but also can provide a little bit of contouring as long as it's not orange I actually have a a follow-up question the idea that you can change the appearance of your face shape is causing a lot of problems in AI right now where they're trying to find what they're calling makeup invariant AI facial recognition So I just was wondering like what you thought about that, like the way that you can transform actual facial structure. Mm. I never really got into the whole Mm. kind of like changing the shape of my face, so to speak. I was reading an article that said that the pandemic has kind of ruined the contouring industry that people it's just changed. like have stopped caring and that it's like it's no longer really a thing oh well i feel like it must have ruined the makeup oh, industry sure. in general because who's buying makeup yeah the yeah. lipstick index is out the window emily is also a financier do you have anything to say about that 
I read makeup related news and like keep up with different launches and stuff that are coming out. And from what I've heard with like other people, you know, talking about how their techniques or the way that they put on makeup and use makeup has like changed in the pandemic. One, if we're all staying at home, how many people are really going to be putting on like a full face of makeup to stay at home? Two, if you're going to be wearing a mask all the time, like having a lot of foundation or lipstick on can irritate your skin if you're wearing a mask all day or it'll smudge and things like that. So one of the things that I think has been interesting to come out of the pandemic in terms of like the makeup skincare industry is more people are focusing on like putting time and money into their skincare routine. So changing products from like covering up to using things that are more hydrating Mm. or help tackle like problems. So you can have hope that your skin might look more the way you would want it to without putting makeup on top. And one thing that I've started doing for myself is wearing less product overall, not making it look quite so heavy. Cause for years and years, even like on a daily basis for work, I would do that full 11 step routine every single day. And now I only do that maybe like once a week if I'm going out with like friends or for dinner. With or something. your boyfriend. You go out with Yes, your if I'm seeing if I'm seeing a boy or if I'm seeing friends are just doing anything that involves socializing because any time to go out of the house and socialize after the last year and a half is a special occasion now. True, true, true. So I will wear pretty basic makeup. Like I'll do a like skin tint or, and like some concealer, like a little bit of brow gel, some mascara, and then like a little bit of like bronzer blush highlight. And then like a basic lip gloss, which is crazy compared to kind of how I would do my makeup before everything that happened. So I'm getting more used to now seeing my skin like a li- or like my makeup routine a little bit more pared down, like using fewer products, focusing more on the skin part of everything rather than the color part. I still love doing my makeup and like having makeup on, but in the absence, I think of also like seeing a ton of people on a daily basis and like having to look professional or going out and doing a lot of things I used to do, those changes have also reflected in the way that like I do my makeup sometimes. So that is consistent with the research that I was reading about the trends where like, as Lisa was saying, the lipstick index no longer holds because usually lipstick has in times of economic turmoil has been one of those affordable luxuries that has continued to be resilient against economic turmoil. And according to Cult Beauty, which is really big in the UK, I don't know if it's big in Canada too. I think you can buy stuff from there, but I think it's just a UK-based website. It's a fantastic website because we don't have Sephora, so we use Cult Beauty. But apparently their uh, lipstick and foundation sales have gone down up to 70%, and their skincare has increased. So I think that their bottom line has remained relatively stable, I suppose. I don't, I don't actually... I haven't combed through their finances in detail, but uh, that's what they were saying. There is this trend. And I have a, a, a follow-up question about that. I got really into Korean dramas during one of the phases of lockdown. <laughs> and the Korean beauty products and the Korean skincare is completely a completely different ballgame. Have you explore Korean beauty or I've used quite a bit of not just Korean but Asian based skincare so like some Japanese brands some Korean brands like the sunscreen that I use on a daily basis is a Asian skincare brand I don't know if it's Japanese what's the brand tell us tell us I'll show you on the screen it's the Misha Essence Sun Milk SPF 50 plus 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 wait what is it it's just like a facial sunscreen M I S S H A Misha. But this is a skin the sunscreen I've been using for 3 years now. And the one that I really like about this is it works really well under makeup. Like it creates a really good base for that. There's no white cast or anything. It doesn't make me like break out. It doesn't have a lot of alcohol in it, which is an issue with a lot of sunscreens. So, highly recommend this one. In general, I would say that Asian skincare is so much better in terms of everything SPF. A lot of instances, and this is getting a little bit deep, is that makeup has a lot of racial and like political undertones to it with like not having accessibility for, you know, people who are darker in tone or have less common undertones and things like that. It's, you know, at least in like Sephora brands, we're seeing 
a lot of them trending in like a better direction, like having products that can be accessible to like lots of people. Well, this is why like Rihanna is now worth over a billion dollars. Fenty is worth a billion dollars. That's crazy. Yeah. But it's like she popularized having concealer and like foundation to include a variety of skin tones, not a variety of white skin tones, but an actual variety of skin tones. So there was a couple makeup brands that existed at the time that were like well regarded, like Mac always had kind of a really good line. There's another brand makeup forever that was well known for their foundations, but most mainstream brands, especially in drugstores too, have a lot of foundations that are geared towards Mm -hmm. like the light medium spectrum and the way that Fenty did it which I think a lot of people still like really applaud her for when she released the brand is to have 40 foundation shades, like in the very first launch and a lot of complexion products that could be used by a lot of people, which was Mm -hmm. something that I think really shocked other brands who were coming out with these very like lackluster shade ranges. So now you have a brand new company from Rihanna that's doing it on the very first launch. There's really no excuse for like these established brands to continue releasing terrible shade ranges with like their foundations, their bronzers, their blushes. Right. Do you think like the rise of Sephora that made higher end beauty products more accessible to the public? Cause I feel like our mother's generation would just walk into a drugstore and they would never think to go beyond Maybe the makeup counter at the Bay or like a department store, but you'd never think to go beyond that where like our generation, like Jen and I are not super into makeup. I mean, we are by proxy and we are sort of now because Emily gives us her makeup, but we're not like super into makeup, but I would only ever buy my makeup from Sephora or Cult Beauty. I would never go to a drugstore. I think like the drugstore kind of gets a bad rap and like they obviously do have like a lot of terrible products and like products that are a waste of money, but I think it's almost been like a one-to-one relationship with the rise of like influencer marketing and Instagram and social media and YouTube and things like that. How make has become popular through that. Like we have sponsored posts from like all of these big Sephora brands that 10 years ago, they wouldn't have really been doing this kind of stuff. So it's become very accessible. And as a marketing tool, it's like very direct to the consumer to see oh well they're talking about this two-faced palette from sephora and they're saying all these amazing things about it's now i want it too kind of thing and it's relied a lot on that on like the change of how marketing is done tiktok has made us buy multiple things including the mascara that both lisa and i use right now because tiktokers were like this is amazing we're like i believe you Yeah, it's it's one of the better mascaras I've used. It actually it's amazing. I love it. It works so well on my lashes. Somewhat going back to what we were talking about, just like taking care of your skin. Have you given a lot of thought to the chemicals and how exposing your skin on a regular basis to so many different products, like what that might potentially do in terms of health? Probably not as much as I should. I don't know if I've ever thought about it. I just put stuff on my face if I hear it's good. (laughs) There's like a couple of controversial ingredients that like come up in skincare. One of them being like Mm. parabens and there's research that I think that's probably one of the ones that's most commonly like vilified or one of the more controversial ingredients. The thing is, is that it's hard as an individual, Mm -hmm. like from a consumer perspective, who doesn't have an understanding in science to try and make sense of what people are saying, especially in terms of mixed messaging. Mm -hmm. So if there's some studies saying like these ingredients should be avoided at all costs or they're actually safe, especially because makeup and skincare, at least in the West, is not heavily regulated by like different health authorities. I know that the European Union and... Um, Asia that everyone kind of has different standards for like Mm -hmm. what ingredients are acceptable there are hundreds of products hundreds of chemicals that are not allowed in European in the EU beauty products but are not banned or are commonly used in in North America still yeah it's the same with a couple of pigments too like eyeshadow colors some are they're not allowed to be labeled as eyeshadows because they have dyes that are not considered eye safe but are still marketed in eyeshadow palettes so they're not i think like the issues are more so like they'll cause irritation or they can cause staining but you know is there a reason that some health authorities have said like these are probably not safe and shouldn't be used in the for this purpose whereas other countries are like 
well, we're fine with it. So like, why, where does that disconnect come from? Like, what are these different organizations looking at these differently? Mm -hmm. But I think that you like made a really good point that the regulation of beauty products is is really different from like other consumables like food. And I guess we have come a long way from just basically putting pure lead on our face because that used to be (laughs) the thing and everything was like just copper and lead and like charcoal burned things yeah (laughs) Yeah. so I do think that there is a little bit more awareness of you know potentially some things shouldn't go directly on your face I think is a really important question because as an individual consumer it's really hard if you don't have a chemistry degree to know what products might be damaging and if health authorities aren't regulating it like what are we supposed to do as individuals who just really like wearing lipstick yeah can i share you the grossest fact that i came across is it that there's whale blubber and lipstick no it's that a person who regularly wears lipstick will swallow 4.5 kilograms of lipstick in their lifetime that's a lot of lip whoa my insides are beautiful my insides are like our rainbow color yeah considering like i'm just gonna pull out a lipstick now and see how much it weighs like how many tubes is that 4.5 kilos okay that doesn't have a weight on it but this one here it's a liquid lipstick so it's different but this one is four milliliters or 0.13 fluid ounces so like a milliliter in is a thousand milliliters is one kilo so you're (laughs) So if it's 4.5, 4, 4 then that, oh, so you're 400 of those. 400. And four. So that's like literally hundreds of full tubes of lipstick in your lifetime. My first foray into cosmetics, it was via Lip Smackers. Oh, in great. the 90s. Great lip, lip Smackers. Cherry. It's the only I flavor. had a tropical fruit one, which I loved, and it smelled so delicious that I took a full bite out of it. It didn't taste delicious. And now anytime I smell that like kind of like indeterminate tropical punch, which is like the mixture of were you dumb as a child? Yes. What is obviously it smelled so good. No. So yeah, every time I smell that, I'm like, oh my goodness, it's it's tropical fruit lip smell. Oh my god. So I probably have more than 4.5 in yeah 4.5 plus a whole lip smackers yeah okay let's let's ask you okay these are the tough questions coming up without thinking you can only pick one what is your go-to eyebrow brand go glossier boy brow okay mascara right now it's tart surfer curl love it all-time favorite is Too faced better than sex eyeshadow palette all time i'm looking am i allowed to like quickly look through my products that i have right now yeah of course Ooh, um the melt cosmetics gemini palette lipstick Ooh, the fenty Ooh. beauty uncuffed lip liquid lipstick the color is called uncuffed the the line is called the stunna liquid lipsticks they're in like this little tube but it's like a pinky color and i'm obsessed with it all-time favorite lipstick ever or because i have two the dose of colors aftermath lipstick which is like an orangey brown that one is like one of my all-time favorites to have on my face you and i are actually so such different coloring though that it's like hard for me to get on board with your choices okay probably true (laughs) this is why you like the lipsticks that i give you because i don't like them on my face yeah exactly symbiotic I love relationship the, i love all the disney okay i have a yeah. rapid fire question for you what are the essentials that are always in your purse Ooh, i always have a lip gloss so it's either going to be usually one of the fenty lip glosses or the glossier lip glosses like i always have one of those i usually carry around a concealer for touching up don't really use it a lot of the time but those would be like the two things that I keep with me. And usually like not a makeup product, but a little bottle of travel, like a travel size perfume mm. that I would get as a free sample. Always have one of those. Oh yeah, good on one. Hand just in case. Those might be the only samples that I always use up. 
Yeah, me too. I sometimes question how we're related to our mothers, Emily. Neither of our mothers are into makeup at all. That is true. That is Especially true. not my mother. Especially. She thinks like doing your nails is like, oh, I'm so fancy. Me. Okay. <clears throat> are you ready? Yes. Tea or coffee? Coffee. Summer or winter? Summer. Uh, being too hot or too cold? Too hot. What's worse, laundry or dishes? Dishes. I hate doing dishes. Oh, but no dishes allowed in the house. And if you leave your dish out, Lisa, you're going to get yelled at. That's well, yeah, because you leave dishes all over the place without cleaning them. For like an hour when I was still using them. Ugh. Okay. Uh, sun or moon? Moon. Early bird or night owl? Night owl. Love or money? Love. Oh, I knew you would say that. So romantic. I did have a bit of a pause. Yeah, you did have a pause. I feel like introvert or extrovert? Introvert. Gold or silver? Gold. Lip gloss or lipstick? Lip gloss. Ooh. Okay, last one. Gryffindor or Ravenclaw? Ravenclaw. Yes! What? Team Ravenclaw! You're in Ravenclaw? Yeah. I would have guessed I that. I feel like I didn't know, Emily. I feel like I would be either a Ravenclaw or a Hufflepuff. You're a Ravenclaw. Oh my God, you wouldn't be a Hufflepuff. Don't no. insult yourself like that. I I don't actually know what the criteria are. I just know I would not be a Gryffindor. Okay, well, Gryffindor's on the cool list, so then you're obviously not on no. the cool side. You are on the very smart, very intelligent, very... Very socially awkward and dumb side. <laughs> No, just excellent side. Ravenclaws are excellent. So I they welcome have you to friends. the fold. Hey, I, I have friends. I have friends. I like to friends on this podcast. I like friends sometimes too. <laughs> so there are some other things you can celebrate on August the 4th. But the second most important one behind makeup is chocolate chip cookie day what i love chocolate chip cookies just such a good Mm -hmm. classic yeah yeah can't go wrong with the chocolate chip is that it yeah there's really nothing else on the fourth well some famous birthdays we have john venn the inventor of venn (gasps) diagrams such a diagram oh it might be my favorite diagram Oh, it it is the best one. Louis Armstrong, just a great trumpeter. And Barack Obama, probably my favorite president. I mean, I don't really care that much, but, you know, if I was to pick. And my family member, Roro, Emily's father, August 4th. What a good day. Happy birthdays to all of them. Okay, that's it. I talk to you later. Okay, bye. Bye. Days on a days, my friends, the RFs and the sends that say and dance and make a bunch of noise. So let the fun ensue. Learn a thing or two. These are the days.